talk about some things. You know, a lot of it will, will reinforce stuff that uh, Kay Kirkman talked about. We worked independently, but happily have found a lot of the same sorts of results. So that's kind of the way science works. You know, if you duplicate things and come to the right same conclusions, and you know there might be something going on there. But I'm going to try to talk a little bit about uh, the effects of native ground cover and uh, versus um, areas with a more of a history of soil disturbance, how that influences fire behavior. We've done some research on it. You know, some of it's anecdotal. But I'll share what we have today and kind of what we've what we've learned and observed so far. You know, we probably don't need to tell anybody in this room that uh, there are differences in the way fire behaves in native ground cover in these areas and versus an area that's got a, a history of being an old field or somewhere that's been missed recently, right? And we know that, um, like Kay was talking about, these are some of the most flammable fuels. They seem to have been evolved to burn. You know, the, the way that the grasses are structured, the long leaf pine needles, the high energy content of the needles. And one of the things that we measured. Uh, all kind of comes together to make a very flammable habitat. You know, if you're, you, some of you in the, in the room probably have the same experience as I have, that you can burn wire grass, for example, when it's 60, 70 percent relative humidity. You know, we've had it burn, it had to start raining, and it keeps burning for about a, a, an hour after it starts to rain, you know, so this is pretty amazingly flammable stuff. Um, you know, one of the characteristics, of course, of native ground cover. Uh, again, like Kay was talking about, is that the, most of the plants are perennial and have a tremendous capacity to re-sprout and to survive fires. Uh, we did a, a, a little study this past summer where we just flagged about six, you know, it was six different species, and one of them was wiregrass, and found that there was a, about a 97 to 98 percent survival, even of these little forbs like, um, what's a Sericocarpus um, portfolius? It's a, it's, a, it's an aster. I guess they call it uh, blue aster. And then also um, uh, Atlantic pigeon wing, Cotillaria, uh, uh, Marylandico, you know, just a few of these kind of common forbs, but they, they just, they all survive. You know, even in some of the plots that we burned, there was a five year rough. And it was fire you didn't even want to be close to, you know, it really cooked everything and, you know, no problem. And of course, you know, one of the reasons that they have these, these root stocks, so they're known for uh, having what some people call uh, under, underground storage units or, or tubers or you know, uh, they, they put most of their resources on the ground so they can have their tops taken off and re-sprout again and these are just some, some common species showing these kinds of uh, these, these um, growths on, on the base. I'm trying to, trying to make the, uh, I was trying to make the point our work and missing. You know, we can, uh, the, the, you can feel these, these kind of things, that there's the woody masses at the bottom. And, 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 you know, some of them are quite spectacular. The Stalingia sabbatica has got this huge thing, and like, um, uh, you know, morning glories have these giant potato looking things uh, underground. And, you know, there's been research on these internationally. Uh, some researchers, including, um, including uh, uh, Joe Veldman and his colleagues, have called these uh, old growth grasslands, and they're not just talking about southeastern pine savannas, but but also savannas in Africa and South America and Asia. And one, they have a lot of, lot in common. You know, the, this southeastern ecosystem is part of this kind of worldwide savanna type ecosystem where the plants have a, a tremendous amount of storage underground. They're very good at resprouting, um, very perennial. In fact, they think some of these individual plants. You know, nobody really knows how old a single clump of wiregrass is. It could be over 100 years old. We don't really know. Nobody's really tracked it. Uh, they, they found that um, from aging the roots in Africa, some plants that are little small forbs, they think are maybe even a thousand years old. Um, and so they're very perennial. They, they've used the, the expression "old growth grassland," which just kind of strikes you funny at first. But when you start to think about it, um, what they're saying is that the herbaceous vegetation in these systems have a lot in common with what we think of as an old growth forest and that the individuals are very old, they're persistent, they're perennial, uh, they're, they're kind of like what you would traditionally think of as a climax community in the old you know, successional models in that they, uh, they don't change very much uh, over time. And that's very different than the conventional sense of grasslands which people would describe it as early successional. They're saying that's actually quite the opposite. These are not rootable systems that invade newly disturbed areas very well, but they're very persistent, long-lived perennial systems that hang in there uh, through fire after fire after fire. So you have a lot of perennial plants, a lot of root energy storage, high re-sprouting capacity, but uh, the trade-off there is the sensitivity to soil disturbance because if you've got all your resources underground and you disc up that, uh, that, that root system, then it, you can take out the plant 
And um, you know, one of the trade-offs apparently for their being persistent in one place and just resprouting and resprouting and resprouting is that a lot of these plants are kind of limit, limited in their dispersal ability. You know, wiregrass, like the, uh, the other presenters were talking about this morning, is famous for its lack of ability to get into new places. But there are a lot of other species that seem to be like that too. Not all of them, but some of them um, have kind of traded off their ability to get into new places for just kind of hunkering down and staying. <clears throat> So that means that um, soil disturbances like disking, you know, roller chopping, uh, maybe heavy um, forestry activities can uh, eliminate certain species. And, um, you know, there are two different aspects of soil disturbance. If you remember Kay's slide where she showed that, you know, you've got this extreme over here of uh, a pasture land where you've got no species, and then over here you've got a, the way tractor, you know, an old growth longleaf pine forest that's been burned frequently and never been disturbed. Um, in thinking about the effects of soil disturbance, I kind of, we kind of think about them in two different ways. One is you've got an area that was over here that was completely blitzed of all of its plants, and how well can native plants get into those areas? That's one question. And then another question is if you've got a nice native system, but then you soil disturb it, how well can those plants survive that? Are you all with me on that? Yeah. Like those are kind of two different questions, right? Even though they both have to do with soil disturbance. So one plant actually might do fine with the immediate impacts of soil disturbance, but they don't do very well at getting into a, um, an old field or vice versa. Like an example of that we found is, is um, pineland twin flower, a discristi along the foliage, little thing about this big that has the two blue flowers, it's ubiquitous. Um, we don't find it in our old fields at all. It doesn't seem to be able to get in there, but then if you disc an area, then it seems to come back pretty, pretty quickly if it's there already. And I think it might be because of um, the agricultural activities I, I should say, before I go any further, and I forget, everything that I'm going to talk about today is in um, Upland, what the Florida Natural Areas Inventory would call Upland Pine Forest, or Clay Hills, or Ultasols, where you've got a clay-rich BT horizon. So that's a little bit different than the previous talks that have so far been about flatwoods and, you know, spotosols and, and sandhill intasols. But um, I think the, uh, the farming activity caused a lot of erosion of that sand cap so that certain species just don't come back establishing there because of the change in the soils and agriculture. So, you know, you've got different things going on with different species. Um, but the first thing I'm going to talk about is this effect of, uh, okay, you've got an old field and it's abandoned, but you put fire in it, you burn it, you kind of, you know, manage it right. What, what happens over time? And we have a lot of examples of this in the area where Tall Timbers Research Station is, which is in the middle of the Red Hills region of the, the, the quail hunting um, areas where it used to have a lot of agriculture because the, the clays are heavier than most places. It's pretty good agriculture north of Tallahassee. In fact, the Native Americans, you know, farmed there uh, for hundreds of years before DeSoto and his, his people came. You know, those big Appalachian old fields, they were there because it was good farming. And then, um, you know, European people of European and African descent farmed on it as well. Uh, but around the 1920s or 30s or before then, you know, around the turn of the century, a lot of this land was abandoned but they wanted to, to use it for quail hunting, and so they continued to try to get fire in there as soon as they could, uh, but it came back as a kind of a different vegetation type. And I think most of you are familiar with the differences between like a longleaf pine, wiregrass, dominated upland pine, clay hill, and a, in an old field community that's a little more forby, a little weedy, a little heavier with uh, broadleaf plants, and a lot of kind of off-site woody plants that kind of get up in there. And, and also your, your pine species, you've got loblolly and shortleaf mostly in these old fields as opposed to longleaf, although there are some native shortleaf sites as well that we've done a little bit of work on. So this is a, the location of where we did some of our work here on Pebble Hill Plantation in southern Georgia in that Red Hills region. Um, and we, we've actually, one of the studies that we've done, like I mentioned, was comparing what we think is shortleaf pine, oak hickory, native ground cover, longleaf pine, wiregrass, in the areas that we know from like aerial photographs or other historic records of the old field. So we're not going to talk too much about the short leaf, we'll just focus on the long leaf and old field. But we did a study looking at uh, these 10 by 10 meter, 100 meter squared plots on Pebble Hill Plantation and also on Avalon Plantation um, in the southern part of the Red Hills and also on Tall Timbers Research Station just to compare uh, vegetation characteristics between these different, uh, these different land use histories. Yeah, we use these 10 by 10 meter plots. We look at a 1 meter square, 10 meter square, 100 meter square, and just find all the plants that we can in the fall primarily. And this, uh, um, 
multivariate analysis of principal components analysis, where basically each one of these dots is a 10 by 10 meter plot, and the, their proximity tells you how similar they are in their species composition. And so the green dots are, are long leaf, and these red dots are old fields, and you can see that they, they, they cluster pretty much, I mean, they're, they're not even overlapped. You know? So you've got different, different vegetation type, which we know from looking at it, but it's good to have the data and to really kind of confirm that. And then, you know, we've got this, these native short leaf sites is something different, too. Um, nevertheless, there's a lot of overlap, about 50%. This is, these are percentages are overlap between old field and long leaf, which, you know, shows that a lot of the species that were in the longleaf pine forest are able to get back into those, those old fields over time. Now again, these are pretty old, old fields. They're about 80 to 100 years old, so they've had some time on their, on their hands, and they've been frequently burned for quail management, so that's been a good thing, and the, and the timber density has been kept low. But you can also see that there are a lot more species in the longleaf you know, that are limited to longleaf than are um, limited to old field, and most of these are weeds, you know, the things like dog fennel and stuff that aren't really, um, you'd only find at disturbed sites. Some of them are exotics. So you got a different species composition. Now here's just a list of um, in order of percent cover in these plots in the native areas versus the old field areas. And you know, those of you with experience in burning, which is most of you here, if you just kind of look at this list and you look at this list real quick, tell me which one you'd rather burn as far as uh, fire effectiveness. <laughs> You know, here, of course, wiregrass is whopping 28%, so that's a huge fuel source. And, of course, that's not even to mention all the pine needles and everything in it. Uh, little blue stem, good fuel. Then you've got, you know, gallberry and, you know, Darrow's blueberry and uh, some of these small statured evergreen or nearly evergreen, very flammable shrubs. And then you've got, you know, flammable oaks like blue jack oak, uh, running oak, sand post oak, um, you know, black jack oak. And, yeah, I should probably qualify that. Dave was talking about those these big turkey oaks being a pain once they get big. But this is, you know, these are ones that are being top killed by fire, so they're they're in the in the understory, and they're flammable. You know, they actually contribute in a positive way to the fuel when they're in that stage, mixed in with the herbaceous vegetation. And uh, you know, over here, you've got um, you know sorghum, new tans, the yellow Indian grass. You know, it, it burns, but it's not very fuel. Sweet gums like you know asbestos. Sand blackberry, beautyberry, partridge pea, I mean, you know, all this water oak, all those things have a, have a negative effect on fire behavior, and those are our most dominant. Room sedge, you know, it's, it burns, but it's, it's not, not the best thing in the world. Uh, so on and so forth. And, you know, that's just anecdotal, but, but we know from experience that what, what the differences are as far as the uh, contribution to fuel to, um, to efficient combustion and, and burning. If you kind of divide these up according to some vegetation character classes, like graminoids, which are grasses and sedges, the uh, the native sites are these are these green bars, and the old fields are these uh, orange bars. And looking at percent cover, you got more grasses uh, in the native ground cover. Of course, the flip flop is true for forbs and vines in the old field as far as cover goes. Again, and vines include things like. Um, you know, cross vine and uh, uh, wild grape and things like that that don't really burn that well. In um, native woody, so those are those those kind of flammable species like blue jack oak and black jack oak and uh, running oak and everything, very dominant in the native. And these off-site woody plants. So off-site woodies are ones that um, historically we didn't see in the uplands when we look at things like the general land office maps and all. So you got we are talking about water oak, um, uh, sweet gum. Uh, live oak, uh, black cherry, those kinds of species that historically, 200 years ago, were down in the bottomlands, but have only jumped up in the uplands because of soil disturbance and fire exclusion or some combination of those, and they don't burn well, right? Um, we, we did a, a study, uh, well, I guess this is part of it, but this is, this is a different study, actually, where we looked at um, a bunch of plots throughout Pebble Hill Plantation, and we measured fuel loads in those plots in uh, native ground cover and in old field vegetation. And uh, it's kind of a busy graph, but it, they have a few different things going on here. The, these two different color bars, the white and the black, are high basal area and low basal area. The cutoff is about 50 square feet per acre basal area. We won't really talk about that too much today. And we also looked at one year versus two year post fire, or you know, one year, two year roughs. But the thing we'll look at here is the, is the difference between the old field and the native ground cover for some different fuel categories. 
And um, we ran uh, statistical analyses. So this C means community type, or uh, old field versus native ground cover. So some of the areas where we got statistically significant differences between old field and native ground cover included uh, the duff layers, where um, duff or kind of partially decomposed matter was higher in the old fields than the native ground cover. And that's in part because of all those off-site woody plants, um, leaves falling that don't burn that well. And so you've got a lot of residual fuels and they, they accumulate uh, on the soil surface. Of course, uh, those types of fuels produce a more kind of smoldery and less uh, efficient burning. Um, also, it's mostly loblolly and shortleaf pine needles, which are smaller, so they pack a lot denser on the ground, as opposed to longleaf with its long needles that um, drop their needles once every two years instead of every three, three years, and so they make more of a fluffy matrix and produce more fuel. Um, you know, needle litter, like I was just saying, is higher in native ground cover than old field. Even though the basal, the basal area is about the same, um, the longleaf produce more needles. Um, Dead grass, higher in the native ground cover than old field. Um, Forbes and woody were about the same. Total one hour fuels, you know, higher in native than in old field. So you've got more fuel to burn, and more of it is herbaceous fuel, live herbs. Um, so, you know, again, no big surprises, but just, just data showing that, that these, these fuel matrices, matrices are different. Uh, we measured fire behavior to look at the, the differences between these different categories as well. And um, you know, similar kind of graph here, compare the two communities, where in uh, the native ground cover you had longer flame lengths on average. Uh, you also had uh, higher rates of spread on average in the, in the native than in the old field, not too surprising. Uh, the flip-flop is true for residence time, or just how long flame residence was occurring at one point as the fire passed by. And again, that's a, a result of that uh, higher duff load of fuels that aren't as combustible uh, they, they heat up a little slower, burn a little bit longer, a little more smoldering versus flaming combustion, that sort of thing. Um, again, not necessarily desirable. Uh, fire line intensity, higher on average in the native ground cover. Um, that's, you know, heat release per unit time per length of the fire line. And reaction intensity is heat release per unit time per square meter on the ground was also higher in native ground cover. So pretty much all your measures of fire activity were higher in native ground cover than in the old field areas, um, presumably because of those different, that different fuel composition and different fuel structure, and just abundance of fuel, more fuel. So we also looked at um, percentage of area burned in these plots, and uh, again, these green bars are the native ground cover and the orange ones are the old field. In one year after a burn, the percentage area burned was about, you know, about 90% in the native ground cover and only about uh, 68%. In the, uh, in the old field areas, and two year first burn, you know, you've got more fuel accumulation, so you burn a higher percentage, but you still see 100% in native ground cover, and about 90% in the old field. And as you know, any, any spot on the ground, say you have a you know, one or two year fire return interval, whatever area doesn't burn, that effectively doubles the fire return interval, so you get that much more time for those hardwoods to grow. And if they survive one fire, they're very likely to survive the next fire, and so you get this accumulation of woody vegetation, it gets more and more difficult to control, you know, in your old fields. So um, it's no surprise that we spend more time uh, mowing after fires in the old fields than we would in the native ground cover, having to just go get those, those woody plants that we weren't able to get with fire. And of course that's more money and more time, and more equipment repair and that sort of thing. Uh, the percent tree saplings top killed, you know, closely follows the percent area burn, because for the most part, whatever area burn top kills the trees, but not not 100 percent. So that's even lower. You know, the number of tree saplings we actually top kill is closer to like 62 percent old field one one year versus 90 percent in the native, and then about 90 percent versus 100 uh, percent in the two year first burn areas. So um, so far, I've been talking about the ability for plants to get back into areas that have been previously disturbed by agriculture and how that influences the, uh, the fuel structure and fire behavior. Um, we haven't done quite as much work, but we've done some recent work in looking at the direct effects of soil disturbance on an area that was previously pretty good you know, native ground cover and what those effects are. Right now, uh, Monica Rother, who is supposed to be here today, but she wasn't feeling well, who's our fire ecologist working under me, is doing a big literature search. And she's found about 60 papers, some of a large number, on about 300 species, looking at which plant species 
seem to respond positively to soil disturbance and which ones respond negatively to soil disturbance. And kind of putting all those together and looking what the characteristics are um, between them. So, um, you know, just some of the results from her study, and this is, we're, we're splitting that data set into two parts. One is the ability for plants to get into previously disturbed areas, and the other one is the direct effects of soil disturbance, including things like, you know, roller chopping and uh, just logging activity and, and disking fire breaks. And here's some of the results. The flammable species that are negatively affected by mechanical disturbance are some of our familiar plants that, um, you know, a lot of these are the same ones that didn't do a very good job of getting into the old field areas. Wiregrass, teeth among them, is very negatively affected. Uh, this Aristida purpurescent arrow, arrow feather three on. And again, if you look at these, these are these are these are the things that are contributing to your fuels. Uh, these these woody plants that are very flammable, or otherwise grasses. Um, and and also, you know, this is just an extension of the last slide. These uh, these woody plants, these oaks that when they're in the re-sprouting stage contribute positively to the, to the fire behavior and help you, help you get your burning done. And then conversely, the flammable, you know, well, I shouldn't say conversely, but flammable species that are positively affected by mechanical disturbance, just to, you know, for the completeness of the data set here, are plants that are a little more weedy, like carpet grass, um, you know, slender crab grass. These are the grasses, so they burn, but they're not the kind of bunch grasses that have a lot of fuel that really contribute in a positive way to the fire. Uh, you know, they help, but they're not. But they, they, they produce a lot less biomass, and you get things like um, bees that also positively uh, respond to soil disturbance. And this is all the stuff that you hate to see when you're trying to burn an area, right? Dog fennel, Yankee weed, partridge pea, Crotalaria, You know, your Desmodiums. Some of them, uh, blackberry, Japanese honeysuckle, you know, there's pretty much nothing in that bunch that you, uh, is going to help you much with burning, but those are, the, those are the ones that tend to get into, into disturbed areas, according to this literature. We've done a little bit of, of research um, just recently, actually this is extremely uh, hot off the computer <laughs> work, we, we just finished collecting data for this Friday, uh, Katie and I, and, and, and Monica. So. Um, you're definitely the first people to, to see it. But what we did was, th there are some areas where there's some disking on Pebble Hill Plantation where you had uh, wiregrass native ground cover, and that was three years ago. So this year we just took one meter frames and just put them down in that um, disc lane, because we knew where the disc lane was, and, uh, and then also right next to it in the native ground cover, just to compare, con contrast the, uh, the frequency of plants in one versus the other, and to see if there are statistical differences. So um, these are some of the ones that were significantly associated with the undisturbed area. In other words, they had a lot of them where the disc line wasn't, and then they kind of disappeared in the disc line. And again, a lot of the same you know, familiar species, wiregrass, you know, very much reduced. Southern red oak actually didn't come back in it very much either. Um, again, a lot of your, your flammable, um, small statured woody plants and, and your, your plume grasses, uh, bunch grasses. Uh, you know, I won't go down the whole list, but if you kind of look at it, again, I think if you have experience burning in this area, it's most of these, you can see that most of these either have a positive effect on burning or else kind of a, kind of a, um, a neutral effect, you know, some of these small forbs like creeping lespedeza and milk peas and that sort of thing. Um, these are ones significantly associated with the disc line, which showed up three years after that disc line was abandoned. So, again, you see um, these kind of weedy plants. Uh, I'm trying to see if there's any ones that would burn well in here. Broom sage burns okay. Bahia grass burns well, but <laughs> takes up, takes over everything. Sedges, panic grass, paspalum burns okay. Um, but they come back kind of sparse. You know, one thing that we didn't do that we kind of ran out of time on was put down frames and actually collect the fuel loads. But just looking at it, I would estimate that the fuel loads within the disc line three years after it was disc was probably about a third of what it was in the native ground cover. So you lose some fuel there. Uh, yeah. What that'll do over the long term, I'm not really sure. Yeah. A quick question: Shortleaf pine showing up. Wouldn't you suspect that longleaf should be showing up on that? Uh, longleaf. Well, again, this, these are just ones that were significantly associated with it. In other words, they showed up in the disc line, but they didn't show up so much after. <coughs> we did have longleaf show up in the disc line, but it also showed up in the native ground cover as well. Okay. So because they were kind of balanced, 
I'm not, these, this isn't anywhere close to the whole species list. There are about 150 species we found uh, in those 47 frames we put down. And I'm showing kind of like the top 20 or so that were t tended to be affected. So, you know, but that brings up a good point that most of the species weren't strongly affected as far as presence absence. The structure was strongly affected because it's mostly, it's still mostly bare soil, you know, you just got a few little plants as opposed to this kind of dense, you know, cover of wire grass. But um, as far as how many, you know, most of the plants seem like they'll come through and be able to grow in that discline over time, but other ones don't. And, you know, the ones that don't, I, I would argue, are some of the, the important ones, like wire grass, keep them on. And then a lot of your, um, a lot of your uh, ericaceous shrubs, the little huckleberries and, and, um, and uh, blueberries seem to kind of take it on the chin with soil disturbance which matches our, our, our old field study as well. Um, you know, wire grass, this is the difference in the frequency in the undisturbed plot versus the disc line. And you can see that wire grass was significantly reduced even, you know, three years later. And this is just one disc line. You know, this is just a tractor coming through, dropping a disc, running through, and that was it. Um, we also noticed that disc lines like that that are 30 or 40 years old still don't have wire grass in them. And you saw earlier that wire grass was 30% of the cover. So, you know, that's a significant change in the, uh, in the structure and certainly a, a reduction in the flammability of, of that site. So, um, just, you know, get, getting kind of close to the end of this kind of short presentation, uh, if you have areas that uh, aren't primo native ground cover or maybe doing ground cover restoration, one thing that, that, that helps is uh, reducing soil disturbance, we found, and going more to mowing. Uh, lane, if you're doing hunting lanes or, or, or for reducing um, hardwood cover instead of doing activities that, that have a lot of soil disturbance. Um, on tall timbers in the late 80s or even late 90s, it was very, very shrubby. I mean, there's some areas that were just lots of big hardwoods. So we did a, a, a hardwood cut. And then since then, Eric Stoller has been in charge. has been very, very aggressively burning and burning and burning. And then mowing areas that uh, didn't burn, even areas that did burn that had a lot of woody vegetation, you would mow that. And we've gotten it to where um, it's pretty grassy. You know, this is uh, a picture on Tall Timbers Research Station that um, where there used to be really dense shrubs that because of frequent burning and also taking the soil disturbance out of the system, changing from roller chopping to mowing, uh, has got it to where we can burn it more easily even though it's old fields. Again, they're old, old fields, but it's helped promote the grasses. Um, and, you know, I showed this at the North Florida Prescribed Fire Council. I think some of you, some of you were there. But it's just showing that because we've gotten it more grassy, it's, it's allowed us to open up our burn window better, more like uh, a native system, where you know we've got burns in May and then uh, even in June, along with our ones in April and in March. And being able to spread out your burning allows you to get more burning done. It's also better for the wildlife habitat because you don't have as much black at one time. So these are just some of the other advantages of either keeping native ground cover or restoring the system into more of a grassy um, a grassy structured system for, for getting, getting more burning done and doing it more easily. We've also, uh, Tall Timbers has been involved with the, the Upland Ecosystem Restoration Project. Who, who in here has heard of that? Anybody? Okay, because we're working with the, the federal and state agencies to set up basically demonstration plots where um, they're burning every one to two years, kind of like they would on the quail hunting properties, and reducing the hardwoods and, and just kind of showing the managers the effects of it. And um, a lot of the managers have come to the, the uh, almost paradoxical conclusion that it's easier to burn more frequently than it is to burn less frequently once you've got it in that state because the, the, the fuel is, uh, is reduced, so you don't, it doesn't take as many people to do it. You can burn over a wider range of conditions and for more days because you're not worried about scorching the trees and killing them because you're not burning as much fuel. It gets grassier the more frequently you burn it, and so um, you have more control over the fire behavior. And so there are some advantages to getting that, that fire frequency up as well and getting it more in a grassy state. This is just kind of an aside, but we've done some research on um, looking at emissions from fires and in particular looking at the emission factors for a particulate matter uh, smaller than 2.5 microns, which is a, an EPA monitored pollutant. And the emission factor is just how much smoke or how much PM in this case is produced per unit biomass produced. And it's a real important number for estimating how much pollution is coming from burns. So it's the kind of number you want to try to get right. 
But um, our, our work has shown that the uh, PM emission factor, basically how much smoke is produced per biomass consumed, is, um, is negatively affected by the percentage of, of grass that's in the system too. So shifting from, from a more needle-dominated environment to a grass-dominated environment helps to reduce the amount of smoke that's coming out per, per amount of biomass burned. So it's just another advantage of having a grassier habitat, which corresponds to um, one with a more native ground cover structure. So just a little recap, you know, some of the advantages for conserving or restoring native ground cover. Um, of course, you know, just the native endemic biodiversity itself. Because uh, you notice from looking at those lists of native ground cover versus the kind of the soil disturbance species, most of those native ones were endemics. You know, they had names like Southern this and Dixie and Confederate, and, and the other ones had things like Yankee and Northern and, you know, <laughs> Japanicum, you know. So you kind of get an idea of the distribution of the ones that show up in the soil disturbed areas versus our local plants. Um, of course, native areas are more flammable fuels, which gives us more flexibility in achieving our burn objectives. Kind of puts you in the driver's seat uh, as far as, you know, burning when you want to and how you want to. The wider seasonal burn window, um, native ground cover burns in much more humid conditions, so that again gives you more burn days and and uh, lets you spread them out better for wildlife habitat uh, purposes, etc. Uh, less mechanical management needed. You can do it with fire in a grassy habitat, and you don't have to come clean up with the mowers and the choppers and everything like that, and uh, reduce emissions as well. And you know, again, this is in these clay hill habitats. I know that in sand hills, if you've got you know, nothing but uh, salt palmetto or cabbage palm. You know, there's a place for roller chopping for actually reducing the competition with herbaceous vegetation and those sorts of things. But in these clay hills, they seem to be pretty pretty sensitive to soil disturbance. Um, you know, some approaches for making sure we protect native ground cover, just minimize soil disturbance in a general sense. So that includes using natural or existing fire breaks. Uh, you know, what we see too much of, or at least have in the past, is seeing a, a fire racing towards a river and then they cut it off with a disc line, you know, right before it would have stopped at the river or at the <laughs> next road or something. It's, it's some people just like the disc and it's the job and, you know, put, put the fire out sooner than later. But, you know, letting, letting burn units naturally burn out instead of using new disc lines. Reusing the same fire breaks over and over is, is useful. Using roads instead of new fire breaks. You know, these are all things that we do to try to minimize new soil disturbance or knowing where your old soil disturbance is and trying to use those areas instead. Mowing instead of roller chopping, as much as can be done. Following logging BMPs, you know, not logging in the middle of a rainstorm or with uh, too heavy of equipment and trying to minimize rutting. Frequent fire, of course, and then keeping, keeping light on the ground by keeping the, keeping the pine basal area uh, relatively low. So um, that's pretty much it. I'd be happy if anybody has any, any questions to try to answer. Yeah, Brian? Kevin, uh, on the National Forest, we spend a, a little bit of time trying to restore plow lines and have had some limited success, and, and that seems to kind of corroborate what you're talking about. You know, when we're putting native seed mix back in an area that's recently been plowed to bare mineral soil, we just don't see a lot of that seed germinate. And I know you mentioned early on that you thought if one of the mechanisms might be like sort of a change in the soil structure, like top topsoil or sandy layer getting blown off. Do you think compaction has a good bit to do with what's able to germinate in there? Yeah, I think it could because, you know, even though it seems kind of paradoxical, whenever you disc an area, you increase the, the bulk density because you've, you've kind of, I don't know, messed up the natural root, like the soil porosity, and it allows it to pack down as soon as there's the next rain. So and we, we've measured that, too. We've done some soil work on these disc lines as well. I just haven't, you know, analyzed the data yet. So that's a, that's a strong candidate for why. You know, so it may just be a matter of time and allowing um, animals to kind of get back in there and sort of fluff it back up again and get it back to where it's supposed to be in insects. Dave? The uh, mechanical disturbance um, discussion, you, you said that uh, uh, perhaps uh, you, you, you take the example of Santo where it might be good for, for palmetto. Um, but what are your thoughts on flatwoods? Um, you know, we're doing some restoration down our Flint Rock Preserve where our thinking is that kind of the exact opposite, that um, uh, doing chopping is actually going to help our grassy species because we've got such dense uh, cover of uh, a, a lot of our shrub species, and yeah. in particular, you know, solid root mat. Um, yeah, I think it's a different animal. I mean, I think it's yeah, just, okay. just and that, When I was talking about the stall palmetto, I was thinking about <coughs> actually in particular. And Tall Timbers has done, you know, chopping 
of areas and try to get fire back in there. I think the season of burn is at least anecdotally seems to be important for um, reducing the, the, sh the cover of those evergreen shrubs and flatwoods as well, you know, trying to get it in that, that May, June or summer period. They, they, they had a lot of um, success with that in the Everglades on Long Pine Key that Bill Platt was involved in that, you know, trying to shift it more to growing season and help reduce the palmetto a good bit. But um, yeah, sometimes you got to just, you got to break it up. I mean, we look at these photographs right from the 1920s or 30s and these, they're just grassy areas with, kind of dotted with palmettos and you take the same picture now and it's nothing but palmettos. Yeah, you know, something's got to be, got to be done there. And I think something about the wetland soils, I don't know, just anecdotally, we've noticed too that even within the Red Hills and wet areas, the roller chopping doesn't seem to have the same, you know, strong effect on, on changing the vegetation uh, composition as it does in the uplands and the dry areas. I'm not sure exactly why. If it may be because of the soil moisture, I don't know. Any? Can, with the roller chopping, you know, if you have to do it, is can you kind of put it? If you do it too deep, it's yeah. There's a lot of variation. Control in the the. the um, so you could be a little more ecologically sensitive if you have to roll your chop or yeah there's no doubt I mean, that's a, a good point that I mean those of you familiar with roller chopping know that there's a that there's a big dial on it you know that you <laughs> how much water you put in the drum has a big effect on what the roller chopping actually does so you can go all the way from scarifying the top of the soil you know with an almost empty roller chopping to essentially doing the same as disking and if you fill that thing up it'll it'll roll over chunks of soil and really make it look like a disc line, you know, and I've seen everything in between depending on what the particular manager does. So that's a good point that roller chopping is not roller chopping. I mean, you know, you, you, can, you can work with it to get different effects. And I think where they're trying to deal with the saw palmetto, they're trying to get that balance right so they're, they're chopping the roots but they're not getting, you know, not yeah. turning soil over and everything. Yeah. And again, sandy soils and in spotosols, it may not be as important, but in altosols, right. there's a lot of horizonization, if I'm trying to get that word right, the horizons in the soil that you mess up when you, when you disc them or roller chop them and homogenize them, and, and those are very important, I think, for the plants. Because if you're, if you're mixing the underlying kind of clay or soils with the sandy soils, then you're losing that sand cap. Right. And that sand cap, I think, is real important for a lot of species to be able to, that, that's what I think is the different, that, that's one of the important differences between old fields which have had that sand eroded off of them, and you've got the clay on the soil, like your typical, you know, South Georgia peanut farm with the red clay, versus the native soils that have a good cap of sand on them, where a lot of these native that these a lot of these native plants really need. Soil moisture can be another consideration when chopping, and sometimes it's counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. Actually, more moisture is often better for not having the soil get all churned up. And yeah, that's what I was suggesting. Maybe it was the difference in those flatwoods areas as to why it may have less of an effect. Based on some of what we're seeing in South Florida. Right, because it seems like the blades are able to kind of come out without. Yes, it's a clean pulling everything apart exactly. as much, you know. And yet it chops up the palmettos better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's that'd be interesting to learn more about that. You know, to kind of key into. Soil moisture and what kind of impacts it has. So if you have to do it, then you can kind of weigh those little things so you won't do too much damage if you have to. Potentially so, you know. Um, hasn't been much research done on it, you know, but just anecdotally, it does seem like soil moisture helps mitigate the impacts and, of course, you know, the weight of the chopper itself. So there's some some things to be fine-tuned there, I guess, to get the get the right effect without doing any harm. Is there a difference in uh, wiregrass dominance in the in the clay hill versus sand hill, uh, where you know clay hill just has less, generally less wiregrass dominance? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, it varies a lot. I think it has to do with the sandiness and the nutrient like content of the soil. The old field, the new amount of past disturbance. And past disturbance. I think there's just some natural variation in soils as well. I, I mentioned in passing these short leaf oak hickory sites. They don't. They don't have very much wiregrass. They're uh, they're little blue stem dominated. The little blue stems and other species that is kind of soil disturbance sensitive. It's not real sensitive to like roller chopping and light disking, but it doesn't dispersed very well into old fields, but you know, west of Mississippi, there's basically you no know, wire grass, and this is dominated by little blue stem. Oh, okay. We get very similar sites kind of here and there within the Red Hills with almost no wire grass, but I think it's still native ground cover. Okay. And one of the things we've noticed is that the uh, soil nutrient richness is higher, and a lot of times the uh, depth to the clay horizon is shallower, and there's more silt in the soil, a little more clay, you know. You know. 
Um, so I think there's more variation. like the clay so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems to kind of start to drop out when the when this the silt and the clay get get heavier. Yeah. The same with you know with old fields as well. So there's a lot of natural variation, but there's some clay hills that are very dense with wire grass as well. Uh, but there's a lot of variation in the in the depth of the sand cap in clay hills from two to three meters. We measured some places to just ten centimeters, and everything in between. And pretty even on places like the Wade Track, that seem to be you know really intact. It's just geologic history. Would, would, would the sand layer on the Wade Track be? Would it be that deeper? Well, again, like I was saying, it varies. It varies oh, okay. a lot. You know, in most areas, you know, it's about a meter thick. It'll vary. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, and then your mid slopes tends to kind of get a little thinner and a little wider at the bottom. And the big top tops of, of, of the of the ridges they tend to be deeper, you know, maybe because of erosion. But um, yeah, with the way track though, uh, it, it seems to be about a meter thick on the tops of the ridges. It's amazing if you have you been to the way track. Yeah, I haven't looked at this one. Sometimes we, we do this this trick that that, that amazes people. Where we get a, just a piece of rebar and just shove it all the way in the ground. <laughs> it's effortlessly. It's that. You know, the, there's that little uh, bolt density and you know, the structure we get of all the native vegetation and the native animals in it and everything. So it's really interesting to think that that's the way like soils are supposed to be in this region and how much they've really been altered from erosion and from compaction from heavy equipment. So that's, you know, we haven't studied it very much, but when you look, when you compare and contrast the very few areas that haven't had any mechanical operations going on there, you see how much we really impact soils. And how much that probably affects what we're able to grow there, <laughs> including your know, disc lines and everything like Ryan was saying. Okay, well, uh, maybe one more question, I guess. We'll have, have, you, have you noticed a difference in um, species composition based on land use history, like sites that had cattle grazing versus sites that didn't have cattle grazing? The you know different plant species that could be increasers versus decreasers. I don't really you know know anything about the, the cattle grazing question because we just there's just so little of it done in native vegetation now. You know all the cattle grazing is almost completely um, confined to approved pastures. Um, there's some historic literature that has information on that, and but it seems kind of you know conflicted. I mean some people say that cattle grazing influence. I mean that increased wiregrass because they preferred other species to wiregrass. But to me that doesn't make any sense because the one thing that always accompanied cattle grazing historically in the south was burning in the winter every every winter. <laughs> Which to me is like a prescription for getting rid of wiregrass, you know, to burn it when it's can't flower, it can't run, it doesn't reproduce asexually, and then cattle are eating it and I can't see how it could have increased during the uh, you know a couple hundred years of the cattle grazing period of our history. But you know, that's just my opinion about it. But yeah, we don't we don't know, know too much about it. Certainly the soil disturbance history has a big impact, and that's mostly what we know so far. And you know, fire, of course, fire regime, tree density. Those are the, the big three. Light on the ground, fire, and preventing soil disturbance, you know, for keeping these native these native vegetation communities uh, intact. All right, well thanks very much. Thank you very much, Jack.